Guess what time it is, everybody? Say it with me. It's time for some random guy who's never fully developed a game himself to talk about game design as if he knows what he's talking about. Love that show. For the past little bit, I've been really fascinated by how different video games deal with failure. Why failure specifically? Uh... No real reason, why do you ask? How a game decides to deal with failure can directly lead to how well it can retain a player's interest. If every failure beats you down consistently while giving you nothing to counter said beat down, you're unlikely to stick with the game. If failure means nothing, it can dampen your successes in turn, but if you can nail this aspect of your gameplay loop, you can then make every action, positive or negative, far more impactful to the overall experience than it otherwise would be. This idea is kind of my brainchild, it's my big contribution to the video game industry, but in a much more real sense, it has nothing to do with with me, it's something that's been around for dozens of years and everyone already knows about it. One of the core tenets of game design is the idea of positive and negative feedback loops, essentially how the game adjusts and reacts to both success and failure. In a positive feedback loop, every success leads to more success, but every failure leads to more failure, with the go-to example of this being Call of Duty's killstreak system. The more kills you get without dying, the better and better your killstreaks get, and once you let them fly, you're rewarded with a bunch more kills, whereas the more you die, the more your streak resets and you wind up with no access to any of this stuff. The issue here is the same issue that you get with microphone feedback, where the looping gain gets out of hand and produces a high-pitched screech. Early Call of Duty games allowed killstreak kills to contribute to the next killstreak, which just completely obliterated the balancing of a particular match. Negative feedback loops oppose the input, success gets nerfed and failure gets buffed, so they can be brought closer to the same neutral zone. Again, the classic example is Mario Kart. Eighth place can turn into a rocket, whereas first place is left with, wow, a coin, neat. In real life, negative loops are really beneficial for stabilization and reducing distortion in a signal, but applying them at a larger scale means you're probably just bottlenecking a system, and in a game it kind of feels like unfair treatment. Now, both these examples are for multiplayer games, but I'm gonna chuck that out for the rest of the video because it's a whole other can of worms. Single player games also require these loops in some capacity to operate properly, and while there's no definitive answer on which of these two loops are better, it's very dependent on the individual game, I do think there are a few rules that are good to follow when implementing these loops. Rule number one, don't make it too obvious. Demon Souls was the genesis of a genre that's become so relevant in the current day that it's completely revolutionized major sub subsections of the industry, and that sentence was the genesis of me becoming so pretentious that my head literally explodes. This game had a lot of ideas that it threw out there. Some of them stuck and became staples of the soul genre, some of them popped their heads in future games every once in a while, and some were entirely abandoned, with different aspects of its very complicated reaction to failure landing in any one of those boxes. Losing your souls on death and having to go grab them when you come back is an idea that's synonymous with souls-like games, but world tendency and health penalties? Not so much. When you died for the first time in Demon Souls, a big chunk of your health would be removed, and the only way to get it back would be to beat a boss or to use a valuable and rare resource. Losing health feels like a real punch to the jaw, especially for newcomers, and sends the message that mistakes will screw you over even if that's not necessarily the philosophy of other aspects of the game. All of a sudden, the two things a new player knows instantly is that they lose their currency every time they die, and they lose their health if they die even once. At the same time, there's a teeter-tottering effect going on in the background without you noticing for at least a while unless you read up on the game. When you die, you work towards a black world tendency and when you defeat bosses, you work towards a white world tendency. White world tendency is a little bit easier, so again, the player is punished for dying, except blacker world tendency actually grants you more souls when you kill enemies, so you actually benefit from it as long as you're up to the task. This is a much more nuanced system, but it plays out silently without drawing attention to itself, whereas the only reaction to failure that's made obvious to you is your lost souls and your lost health. If I was to guess the number one reason most people quit Demon Souls when they first play it, it's the fact that they need to go kill a whole boss to get their health back, and even if they die once, after that, it gets chopped down again. It doesn't matter what benefits are going on in the background because the game only points your attention to this. Dark Souls 2 forgoes the world tendency thing entirely, but keeps an altered version of the health loss mechanic, which again resulted in a fair share of complaints, but interestingly, with a simple UI change, Dark Souls 3 completely transformed how this concept was viewed. Instead of displaying the health bar as a fraction of itself with that one specific item restoring it to its full potential, using embers in 3 expands your health bar until you die. It's quite literally the exact same system. Dark Souls 3 could have easily represented your normal health in the same way as previous games, but by changing how the bar looked, it felt less like a debuff for dying and more like a boost for specific actions. Same concept, more subtle execution. Games like Resident Evil 4 and The Last of Us somewhat mastered the art of subtle background adjustments. It's never announced to you, but both these games will actually gauge how much ammo and resources to give you based on not just difficulty sliders, but an understanding of your playstyle. And in some cases, they even notch enemy aggression and damage up and down for the same reasons. A lot of encounters in The Last of Us feel like you're escaping 
ripping them by the skin of your teeth even on slightly lower difficulties. And that's because while in most games if you start unloading a full clip at an enemy just to create a nice little zombie shaped outline in the wall behind them with zero shots actually hitting you're gonna be left to fend off enemies with significantly less ammo. In The Last of Us enemies and drawers are populated with an amount of ammo that changes based on how much of it you currently have. It's not a get out of jail free card but all of a sudden this drawer has three bullets instead of its usual one as the game subtly hands struggling players more tools to succeed. Some purists push back on this saying that they should be left with the consequences of their own actions, but ultimately these adjustments can begin to suit your skill level and playstyle more than a rigid system would. And as long as the adjustments are minor and in attempts to create a more engaging loop, they wind up pretty innocuous. There's a difference between not getting as much ammo because you're a good shot to keep the game stressful and hitting four headshots in a row and getting bombed by a blue shell. Which is why I hate this button in the Doom games. Everyone talks about the chicken suit in MGS, but oh man, this button. Listen, I play games that are above my pay grade. I know I suck at them, but I play them at a hard difficulty, not to get through an encounter on my first try, but to get through it on my 40th. That's just who I am, a straight lunatic. Now I'm a firm believer in the idea that if you have difficulty settings, they should be changeable at any point in the game. Give me the option just in case I realize partway through that I really did screw up with my choice, but don't give me this button. This thing shows up when the game decides that you've died enough, when it looks at you and goes, hey man, most normal people would have beat this fight by now, do you need some extra armor? How dare you? I have way too much pride for this button, even if, yeah, maybe a reasonable person would accept that they need it, that's not how I play, and every time I see it, I get annoyed. I know I suck, game, I don't need you to tell me that I suck too, it's a very helpful button in theory, but I can't stand it. In the case of a game like Doom that's so skill-based, I think dynamic difficulty should be off the table, and so should this option, just stick a regular difficulty selector and let the player go and manually change it if they want to. But if reacting and changing in these ways based on player death is something that suits a certain game, then it's important to be sneaky with how you convey and display that. Rule 1 if you can sell is largely applicable to negative feedback loops. If a game is opposing your actions and skill, the more clear that it makes that fact, the more the player feels either babied or restricted. Rule 2, on the other hand, is one that's most important for positive feedback loops. Don't let it snowball. If being good at a game begets good rewards continually without a system of checks and balances, things can rocket off a bit too fast, and the gap between both player skill and player enjoyment becomes less of a gap and more of an endless chasm. A lot of games that have skill-based currency or upgrade systems suffer from this problem. The better you are, the more money you get, the more money you get the better equipment you have, the better equipment you have, the easier it is to be better. While people struggling with the game are constantly getting shafted when it comes to upgrades and never get the opportunity to succeed going forwards because they're always playing catch up. While I gave a handful of examples for rule one, this time around I want to focus on one game that I think perfectly demonstrates both the ideal way of appropriately capping the benefits and downsides of your gameplay loop and the less ideal consequences of letting failure compound on itself, and that example is Nex Machina. Nex Machina is an incredibly fun arcade shmup from House. I was super into this game for a little bit, but it has a massive difficulty spike at one point that comes as a direct result of its poor handling of player failure. In this game, you're doled out a steady stream of power-ups as you progress, including a couple of sub-weapon options and super helpful modifiers like triple dash and spread shots. There's five power-ups in the game on top of the sub-weapon of your choice, and you can hold all five at once, but past that point, you can't get any more. When you do get hit, the short-term punishment is the loss of one of your power-ups and one of your lives, which leaves you slightly less powerful than you were a second ago. Players that are good at the game are able to retain their lives with a maximum of five at any one time, but they don't turn into an unstoppable beast in comparison to somebody who's died every once in a while but has managed to recuperate their upgrades and extra lives, which feels like a good way to balance things out. Getting hit isn't pleasant, you're not as strong or secure as you just were, but continuing through the level you'll be able to get all of this stuff back if you're careful. This completely changes once you get to the third boss. The third boss in Nex Machina is one gear higher in difficulty than what's come before it, which is totally fine, that's to be expected, but the game's punishment for death becomes infinitely harder to swallow at this point. This is one of those bosses is that you accept that you're not going to be able to get through perfectly unless you completely master the game, unlike the last two bosses which I usually beat without taking damage, but the thing is, taking damage in this game screws you over in more ways than one. In a game like Cuphead, if you lose a life, the only drawback is that you're one step closer to death, you're allowed one less mistake, but it changes nothing else. Here though, the instant that you get hit, you're now either doing less damage or have less of an ability to evade attacks, and there's no way to get those things back. So when you almost inevitably get hit at some point in the fight, the boss's health is either effectively getting bigger as a result, or you're now more likely to get hits. It's a massive speed bump where you can't stop the bleeding. One hit makes the fight go on longer and makes you more susceptible to damage, meaning there's a higher chance of you getting hit a second time and a third time until you're dead. On top of that, as an arcade game, Next Machina forces you to start from the beginning when you die fully, so you can be out here playing perfectly for two whole bosses and three whole levels, armed to the teeth, and then you get hit once in this fight and everything crumbles with blazing speed. The sections after this are also insanely difficult, which means that even if you beat the boss while getting hit twice, you're still nerfed going in 
the level 4, which is just as tough. I think a good counter to this would have been to make the boss semi-destructible. Some games let you target certain body parts of an enemy to bring down weapon systems or drop health for you, but here maybe a part getting chomped off would drop a power-up so you'd at least be able to mitigate how much firepower you potentially lose during this fight. It would still align with the rules of the game, and I think it would have eliminated the spike in difficulty, but instead you're left with a boss halfway through that you all of a sudden need to turn into an arcade god to stand a chance against. The concept of destructible enemies is in general an interesting addition to this conversation because oftentimes this can result in a more complicated, shifting loop. Enemies will obviously damage you over the course of a fight, but you can take away some of their more troublesome weapons earlier, maybe even gaining health on top of that. The enemy may respond by shifting all of its focus into a different weapon, making it more powerful, meaning this one instance of success led to both a positive response as well as a negative one, which brings us to rule three. It's not too much to ask for both. Sifu is a game where a man can literally slap eight years onto your life. You don't actually die until you get really old, but every time your health goes down to zero, you age a certain amount of years, which slightly reduces your health, but also slightly increases your experience and in turn, your damage output. The game doesn't stick you with a weaker character, but a stronger one with weaker defenses, not fully dedicating to either loop for this particular system. Aging also blocks you off from certain upgrades. Passing particular thresholds means a handful of moves are no longer up for grabs for that run, but killing difficult enemies reduces your death counter, so you reach higher ages slower. Every time you die, your counter goes up and you age up that many years, but because of the death counter reduction mechanic, every death is not equal. You can die 5 times and go from 20 to 35 if you don't fight a tough enemy between that time, but you can also die 5 times and go from 20 to 25 if you beat a tough enemy between each death. Success doesn't give you anything extra necessarily, but it reduces your punishment for when you do fail. A lot more goes into Sifu's progression, it's very layered, but even just focusing on this aging concept, we can see how beneficial creating a healthy mix of both loops can be. I know I've already talked everyone's ear off about the glory kill, but it just solves so so many problems at once. It's hands down one of the best modern gameplay mechanics, period, in my humble opinion. One of those problems it solves is diminishing the skill gap of skill-based games through its unique effect on health. Most games run on either finite or infinite health systems. Finite ones have health bars and maybe a health pack on the ground or consumables in your hand, but once you're out of those in any specific encounter, you're out of possible health. Infinite health systems usually take the form of recovering HP over time. You can technically take 300,000 bullets to the face in a COD campaign and never die once as long as you duck behind cover at the right time and wait for your health to come back. The glory kill takes a finite health system and makes it technically infinite. You can always get more health during a fight, you just need to do one thing right every once in a while. That means someone can make mistake after mistake, be an inch from death over and over, and always, no matter what, there will be an out, either by chance or by design, if you can quickly make the right move at the right time to counter all your failings. This fits less into the idea of loops in general, but it's a system where the game always gives you a chance to make up for playing poorly in order to stay alive just a little bit longer, and in a more elegant and less in-your-face manner than Mordor Games' Last Stand mechanic, for instance. But my favorite example goes all the way back to Demon Souls and that core concept of losing your souls on death. Unlike the health loss, this consequence is not final and not the result of a single mistake. You can always get your souls back and you can use them in between so one death doesn't cut you off at the legs. Which is why I think it can afford to be a bit more obvious. But there's actually an interesting hidden benefit to the system when it comes to grinding levels. See, in most games, if you had to restart a checkpoint 20 times in order to beat it, the amount of resources resources and whatnot you would have collected would have been the same as somebody who got through it on their first try. You don't save your winnings and XP from the last failed attempt into this new one, you start with what you had when you reached the last checkpoint. On the other hand, in a Souls game, yeah the checkpoints are way more spread out, but if you can get back to your lost souls, you get the total of what you had before and what you got on the road to getting back here. You're still playing the core game, you're still trying to get through whatever tough section you're at, but you also might unintentionally be grinding souls while you're at it. Of course, you can also fail to reach your souls and lose a bunch of them so you might end up needing to grind at some point anyways, but that's the maddening flip side to this mechanic. It's up to your ability whether you benefit from the system or get shafted by it, but both are possible. And I think it's that sense of relief and even gain that peeks out from behind the sense of devastating loss which makes this idea such a central aspect of such a massive genre. Everyone will react to failure differently, and every game will need to adjust for that based on their own intentions for the product. There's no one-size-fits-all solution for how to deal with it, and not all solutions will appeal to every type of player. But for the most part, I think you can gather a lot more intel on the implementation implementation of a successful positive or negative feedback loop past just which one was it. Sometimes all you need is a small adjustment, a bit of both worlds, or even a change in the interface to keep the player engaged and unbothered by how the game shifts in response to them, and once you can nail that down, there's a good chance that they're strapped in for the rest of the ride. What are your guys' thoughts on how a game should react to failure? Do you have any examples of games that do this well? I'm really interested to see how creative some can get in solving this problem. I hope you enjoyed the video, if you did, leave it a like, if you're new here, subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.